Hello everyone and welcome to Half-Life 2 Lost Coast. You may recall that I mentioned I was going to do this um, a little while back uh, before we got out of the Highway 17 section of Half-Life 2, uh, which this uh, was originally supposed to be a part of, and I fully intended to do that at the time, but I kind of lost track a little bit. Uh, things happened, I had to go places for work, other stuff got in the way, and I kind of lost sight of where I was. Um, I just kept plowing straight through Half-Life 2 and completely forgot about this. So, we are going to go, um, just going to stop for a second and go into this. This is going to be slightly different. There's still um, Half-Life 2 style action and things, but there's a bunch of developer commentary in here uh, that's really, really kind of neat. We're, so we're going to go through all of that um, and let the developers of the game kind of talk about some of their design choices and, and the way they uh, shaped the game as they were creating it. So this is going to be probably much longer than my normal videos, I think. I don't know, my, my video uh, lengths kind of vary, as you no doubt have noticed if you've been watching for a while, but um, we're going we're gonna to go through this whole thing all at once, just one, one big chunk, uh, get through it. Um, and hopefully have a good time. So let's go ahead and jump on into it. And uh, start a new game. I don't think, yeah, start a new game. And we'll turn commentary on. So again, this kind of just drops you in right at uh, where you, I guess, where you would enter the level, I'm assuming, um, during the Highway 17 section of, of Half-Life. You'll notice that the cursor is a little easier to see. It has uh, different bars on the left and right, which signify, as I recall, your uh, your health on the left and your suit armor, or suit... Uh, power on the right, or it might be ammo, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't entirely remember, but uh, the, the cursor style changed with Half-Life Episode 1, I believe, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, I believe, so we'll see that soon uh, once I get through the main game, but we'll go ahead and start here. Hi, this is Gabe Newell, and welcome to the Lost Coast. Thank you, In this Gabe. tour, we're going to be talking about a new graphics technology we've been developing called High Dynamic Range, or HDR. We'll also be giving you some insight into the design and production challenges we faced during the construction of the Lost Coast. First, a quick explanation of the commentary system. To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your use key. All right, to stop that. the commentary, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press your use key again. Some commentary nodes may take control of the game for the purpose of showing something to you. In these cases, simply pressing your use key will stop the commentary. You can't control me. No one can control me. Look at this water. I love, I love the water effects in this game. They're really, they're really something else. All right, the reflections and everything, it's really nice. Like, even, the, even the commentary nodes have reflections. It's so, uh, it's so good. So there's some dude chilling over there. Hi. Hi. He's just like, screw off, buddy. When the art team started to think about a location that would demonstrate the power of HDR, a beach was one of the first choices we made. The visual relationship between the sky, the water, and the rocks is something we could not achieve without HDR. In order for high dynamic range to correctly simulate the light's interaction with the surfaces around you like these wet rocks, we needed more precise information about the surfaces than we've had in the past. And now going forward, we're modeling textures in 3D packages to ensure that the physical information encoded in the texture allows HDR to correctly bounce light off the surface. We also designed the colors and values of each surface to ensure they will be correct across all exposure levels. You can see that you know some of this is, is pretty low res um, compared to today's standard 
today's standards, but this is back in, what, 2004, I think? So, I mean, it's actually pretty good. Um, it, it, it's, it's very good uh, for the time. 2004 may be wrong. 2004 may be wrong. I, I don't recall the exact year, actually. With conventional rendering, seen oh, here, here on go. the left, if something on the screen is 20% reflective, like the wet sand, then the maximum reflected brightness could only be 20% of the maximum brightness of your monitor. HDR's more accurate simulation of light ensures that the sun's reflection on this wet sand appears as it would in the real world, which could potentially use 100% of the maximum monitor brightness. HDR uses Bloom to simulate light that is beyond 100% of a monitor's maximum brightness. Hmm. Interesting. Hello. Hello, chap. You look like a cheery hey. fellow. You there? Hi. I'm Wait a minute now. Standing right Aren't in front you? of you. Oh, uh, you are. You're no. that scientist chap, uh, Friedman. Fishman. Yeah. <laughs> Friedman. You must be here to take on the Combine. Not sure what one man can do, but no other reason to visit St. Olga at a time like this. I'll take you to where they made their base, or as far as I can, at any rate. All right, well, hang on. I gotta listen to this commentary note first. The process of building characters in Half-Life 2 taught us many things. By the end, we believed we'd figured out a more effective process for designing and constructing characters. This fisherman is the first character we built using that process. Design-wise, the fisherman was focused on showcasing HDR and the way light falls on human skin. The highlights on his forehead and nose are good examples of specularity on human skin. You can see how the wrinkles on his cheeks and around his eyes are an example of how we can use normal maps to add depth. Production-wise, the fisherman was built using a similar process to the rocks you saw on the beach. We model the 3D character at a very high detail, then extract much of the physical information and store it in the textures. I guess I should have uh, read or listened to that while I was staring at his face, huh? And maybe I'll have a chance to glance at it here in a minute. Water presents us with a lot of rendering challenges. In fact, we have to render the scene oh, three times. Once for the refraction of what's under the water, once for the reflection of everything above the water, and once from the player's view. Good you can grief. see the reflection and refraction scenes in the two small windows on screen. In the refraction, we calculate per pixel how much water you're looking through to do a volumetric underwater fog to simulate particulate matter. For our full HDR solution, we had to go through the entire engine and modify every bit of code that calculated light and color. For example, these water reflection and refraction renderings had to be improved to support the full range of contrast values. I didn't understand a lot of that, but it sounded... Here, let me just unlock this gate. It sounded very good. Uh, got the key right, right here. There we go. Get along now, laddie. Destroy that gun and no dawdling. There you can kind of see how the light's falling on his face. Ah, here we go. There's a path up the cliff. Step yeah. lightly now. So yeah, you can you can see how the light is falling and reflecting off of his skin and creating shadows Hurry, and lad, wrinkles get up and everything. The path. All right, shut up. I am I'm busy examining your face. <laughs> get going. Shush. I'm going. Jeez. Am I moving faster than normal? I feel like I'm moving faster than normal. If you make it back safely, I'll be here waiting for you. <laughs> I feel like I'm walking faster than normal. That's weird. Is there anything along here? Nope. Just more seashore. Oh, hi. Ah! Oh, 
Okay, so... Oops. Oh, I don't have the... Oh. So, um... Ammo is on the right, health is on the left. That's what it looks like. Ooh, what's down there? Anything down there? Ladder. There's gotta be something down here. That it? Just a little bit of health. Oh, look at the flower. Oh, eh, sprites. Yay. Oops. Yeah. Sprites that are the same viewed from any angle. Gotta love it. Again, it's old technology, but uh, it looked really good for the time. The sprite stuff. Sorry, my ear itches. The sprite stuff has been around. I mean, that that's 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 old technology actually from games like uh, System Shock and Doom and, and things like that. The original. Oh dear. What exactly is happening? Oh, hi. Okay, as long as we're not being chased by anything, we can go ahead and listen to this. The area you're currently entering is called the Cliffside Arena. We were particularly happy with the vertical cliffside in Half-Life 1 and regretted that we didn't iterate further on that concept in Half-Life 2. Mm. Vertical space allows us to force the player to deal with threats from above and below. We find that players focus their view on the direction they're traveling, so by using a cliffside and having the player ascend it, we ensure that the player will look up and be prepared for enemies. Right. If the player's path was to move past the bottom of the cliffside, it would be unlikely he would notice soldiers rappelling down from above and dying from unknown threats never feels fair and certainly isn't fun. Yeah, the, um, you may remember from my playthrough of Half-Life 1, the cliffside, that was kind of neat, you had to scale. Having to scale it. What the frick? Oh. Having to scale that to reach a uh, pipe to get you back into Black Mesa, the um, they actually did. It's it's interesting that he says that because they actually did include a a similar. Um, what's that? Oh, that was a commentary node way the frick out there. Am I gonna get back there? Huh. That is way out there. Um. Hang on, I'm gonna try to get back to that before we move on. Uh, anyway, the in in Half Life Two they did actually have. Jeez. Um, they did actually have something of a of a cliffside uh, of a cliffside section. Get along now, laddie. Destroy that gun and no dawdling. It was much shorter than the Half-Life version. Um, but there was one, it, you may recall. It, it even had a little section that kind of looked like the Half-Life 1 section. Um, 
because it had the it had the big pipes coming down and the grating going around it. I don't know if you remember, but uh, I do. <laughs> the remains of the ship in front of you were once part of a puzzle we cut out of the Lost Coast. The original design of the puzzle was based on the idea of the player and the fishermen cooperating together to solve something. This was the type of puzzle we'd always wanted to attempt in Half-Life 2. Unfortunately, as development on Lost Coast neared the end, and this puzzle still wasn't finished, we decided to cut it. It's always painful to remove work, so we've tried to evolve a process for making those kinds of decisions. For example, with this puzzle we asked ourselves, is this puzzle actually fun? If not, how much work does it need to be fun? Does this puzzle fit within the purpose of Lost Coast? Would our customers appreciate this puzzle being finished more than they would appreciate, say, soldiers repelling off the cliffside? In the end, it made more sense to put this problem on the shelf with other interesting ideas and come back to it later. Hmm. That's neat. Although I wish I w he would have explained more about the puzzle, what, about what the um, puzzle was. But... Huh. I yeah, I don't even know if I've heard that commentary note before. I've played this before. I don't even know if I if I noticed that that was out there. Um. That is not... Dang it. I don't think I'm going to get used to that. Go on through, lad. Hush, I'm going. All right, so where was I? Oh, I was... So am I supposed to go this way or am I supposed to go up the wooden steps? Or does it matter? It might not matter. Oh, they're down there. Where did they come from? Ammunition depleted. gonna die. Uh. No, oh, jeez. Dang it. <laughs> Grief. Alright. Gonna we're just gonna have to pay a little more attention here.
Yeah, one, uh, whoops. One bad thing about fighting on a cliffside is that if the enemies drop their guns and off the side of the cliff, then you don't get the ammo. supposed to be this frustrating. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a technical, it's a technical demonstration level. <laughs> the area you're currently entering is called the cliff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoops. Ow. Major fracture. We're gonna try going this way instead. I get the idea now. So you're supposed to try to go up that way, and then they blow out the stairs. So you have to go the other way. I get the picture. I understand. Did I get the, the ammo from these guys? Yeah, okay. Someone dropped their gun down there, unfortunately. Hang on. No, okay. Thought I saw another gun. Did not. All right. Uh, where are you? We haven't actually encountered those those white guys yet in they're like combine elite I think is what they're called um, in Half-Life 2 we haven't actually seen them yet we're getting close though we're, we're about to from where I've I am right now as far as I've recorded uh, we're getting close close to seeing them just haven't quite made it there yet Doing better. Doing better this time around. Commentary node. Alright. 
One of the features of our HDR solution oh, wow. is dynamic tone mapping. The easiest way to think about dynamic tone mapping is that it's a method of simulating the way the human eye reacts to light. Yeah. In the real world, you've probably walked into a dark room and noticed your eye adjusting to the darkness, letting you see better after some time. Yep. Or you've walked out into a bright day and been blinded by the sun, only to have your eye adjust and allow you to see normally. Your iris is adjusting itself in response to the amount of light hitting your eye. Dynamic tone mapping simulates this by automatically adjusting the exposure of the scene to mimic the behavior of your iris. You can see this as the view moves from the dark tunnel to the bright sun and back again. Here, you can see the way we calculate the amount of light hitting oh, the player's eyes. We take a snapshot of the scene, measure the brightness levels, and then use that to adjust exposure. We consider light at the center of the screen more important than at the edges to better simulate the geometry of the eye. Oh, neat. Even though I don't know uh, a ton about game design, I find a lot of this stuff really fascinating. Ooh, rocket launcher. I actually, at one point, had considered going into game design myself as a career, uh, but eventually did not. I eventually decided not to do that. But uh, it was a thought at one point of mine. Hello. Oh, that's that's good. The courtyard in front of you is a space we call an arena. Arenas are built to hold the player for a period of time and usually contain combat or some other challenge. They often have multiple entry points for enemies, along with a gate of some kind to prevent the player moving on until the challenge has been completed. In this case, the arena is free of enemies until the player solves a puzzle and triggers oh, an alarm. This is a method that allows the player to explore the arena and get a sense of its space before being forced to fight in it. It adds a sense of uneasiness to the player who's expecting to be attacked now that they've reached the goal set for them at the start of the map. The break in the action here is also a crucial part of the level's pacing. It allows the player to recover and explore the world a little after being attacked on the way up the cliffside. Kind of like the, uh, kind of like, kind of like the way, um, how Hayao Miyazaki would add periods, periods of stillness and silence before, uh, before big before periods of big action in his movies. Uh, let me get that. Supply. I'm in desperate need of stuffs. The Source Engine supports a wide variety of shaders. The refraction shader on the window here requires us to copy the scene to a texture, refract it, and then apply it to the window surface. To fully support <laughs> HDR, every shader in the engine needed to be updated. So this refraction shader was improved to support the full range of contrast. If you viewed the sun through this window, it would be refracted correctly. Interesting. It really shows that they did put a lot of thought into this. Alright, so... What am I supposed to... Oh, there's stuff back here, too. A lot more ammo, thank goodness, because I was... I was not doing too hot on ammo. So I said I was supposed to solve a puzzle, but I don't know. Really... Is the puzzle of why I'm not falling down this hole? <laughs> that looks like it's definitely big enough. What puzzle am I supposed to be solving over here? And they are bombing the crap out of that out of that place. Oh, it's in here. 
We wanted to transition from a bright, wide open space into a tighter, closed one to showcase HDR's dynamic tone mapping. Look at that. We also like to focus on contrasting elements in our settings, like ancient human architecture and futuristic combine technology. A monastery fit these requirements perfectly. Monasteries are generally isolated, unlit and built ages ago. They provide a great backdrop for the contrasting combine technology. When we build fictional settings, we try to ground them by basing them off a real-world location. We use this location as a design constraint that forces a logical consistency behind the art choices. It is very beautiful. Churches are great dramatic spaces. They're often lit naturally with extremes of darkness and brightness, which makes them a great showcase for HDR. Gothic churches are the sober monochromatic spaces that you've seen in almost every horror movie or game. Byzantine churches, on the other hand, are very colorful and have a large variety of materials. We wanted that color and material variety to show off our HDR reflections. A lot of ammo back here. So that's delivering, okay, it's delivering to the cannon up there, gotcha. Our games are filled with things we call gates, which are essentially just challenges that the player must overcome to drive the experience forward. We used a puzzle here since the player has been through combat and exploration recently. When we design challenges, we try to ensure that the player's goal and the action required by the player are both fun. It's not hard to create interesting goals for the player, like stopping this machine from shelling the nearby village, but the action required by the player to solve the challenge needs to be fun as well. So instead of something menial, such as hitting an off switch, right. the player gets to use physics to jam the gun's mechanism and cause it to break. Right. If you hadn't figured it out already, that's what you're supposed to do. Moving parts can crush the car, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, you actually have to stick something in there to stop it. Is Church that, is... Uh, okay, that was All right. So, what can I put in there that's not going to get destroyed? Uh, I don't know. Let's just try this crap. It's probably going to get stuck. Is that, uh, that, might not, that might be too small and big, actually. Not this thing.
That was a lot closer than I thought it was. collect ammo before they come back. <laughs> Okay, so I'm assuming I'm going to have to take out that gunship, which is going to be loads of fun. Yeah, I'm not going to try it from in there. in there? Hmm? Wait, the gun? The, the ship's gone away. I hear people walking around, though. That, I didn't actually destroy the chopper, did I? I didn't think I did. Maybe I just scared it off. Oh, there are more, more rockets down here. Oh, hi. This marks the end of the Lost Coast tour. This has been an experiment on our part to see if our community would find it interesting to learn more about our development process. As always, we're I interested did. in your feedback. I can be reached at gaben, G-A-B-E-N, at valvesoftware.com. If people like this, we'll keep producing this kind of content for all of our games going forward. Thanks for listening. to hide here, so we're going to have to do this quickly.
got him. Oh dear. I seriously thought that thing was about to hit us. Or hit me. <laughs> So the question is, do I just quit or actually not sure? Take a swan dive off of the, <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm supposed to go from here. Cause like, like was mentioned, it's not like a full completed, uh, you know, thing. It's just a small piece showing stuff off. This marks the end of the Lost Coast tour. This has been an experiment on our part to see if our community would find it interesting to learn more about our development process. As always, we're interested in your feedback. I can be reached at gaben, G-A-B-E-N, at valvesoftware.com. If people like this, we'll keep producing this kind of content for all of our games going forward. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I guess you just stop at this point. Because there's nowhere to go. Um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. At least I think I, I think it was interesting. Um, anyway, that's that is Lost Coast. So we're gonna go ahead and end it here, and I will continue with Half Life Two in the next episode. So thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like, share it with your friends. Hello. I still hear people walking around out there. Um, and subscribe if you want to see more. Until next time, bye.